Don, how does your IRIS system here differ from what we've seen up until now? Up until now, it's really we've really been looking at microcomputers, really personal computers, and this is really a different class of machine. The biggest difference, though, that separates us out is the idea of us using custom chips developed by Silicon Graphics for our own use to do these three-dimensional calculations. This example here is a Rubik's Cube, and what's, what's going on here is we're calculating the location of all the endpoints of all the faces so that we can rotate those in 3D and do all the hidden surface removals all in a very real-time mode. Why don't we go on to the next okay. uh, demonstration here to give a, an idea of how our machine can be used. What kind of machine, what's the hardware we're using here, Don? This is a terminal configuration that has a little floppy disk on top, but the, the uh, basic computer that we're using here is a Motorola 68000, often used in some of the other um, reasonably high-performance microcomputers. Micro uh, other, the other chips that we actually have are, are called what we call our geometry engine, and it's a high-speed three-dimensional floating point calculation uh, unit that, that runs at six and a half million floating point operations per second. Um, this speed we, in, we are planning to enhance to over 10 million floating point operations just in, in a okay, few what, minutes. What's the demo here? This one is a series of uh, pictures of a, a series of buildings where we're doing a calculation in, in real time. So I'm going to angle up away from the buildings and I'm going to zoom back away. And as I'm zooming away, you can see this, this building get, be, going further and further back. You can see that the light sourcing is done so that uh, the certain surfaces that are closer to the, to the rays of sun are, are visible. Now what I'll do is I'll add uh, buildings in 3D. So you can see as I move around the space, I can actually get to the full panoramic effect of this block. Or I can even zoom in. So I can go through areas. Let's okay. skip on to the next. The next is... What, uh, before we get to that, Don, what would the application be, say, of something like this architectural thing you just showed me? Um, <clears throat> we have several customers that are in the AE and C market, the architectural engineering and construction business, and we have several local companies that are doing piping diagrams and piping calculations for intersections of pipes in, say, nuclear plants. Another case might be for an architectural firm that would, would add software to our product and sell it to the end-user end user architectural people for doing building design, for doing uh, construction of faces, uh, landscape architectural design, um, even an interior decorating, use it to place desk and uh, furniture within a given room. Okay, tell me about this demo now. Okay, this one is, uh, again, it's a three-dimensional object. Uh, it's a, rep a rendering of a robot. So the first thing I'm going to do here is, is get it a little bit larger. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll tip it over so you can actually look at this robot arm from the top. And I'll spin the, the arm around. And now as I'm closer, let me uh, tilt it back up so you can see it from front, from the front view. And in this case, what I'm doing is I have a uh, one button. By touching it, I can cause the shoulder to, to, to move the entire arm up and down. Or I can cause um, another button can cause the forearm to move up and down. And then the last series, I can cause the pinchers to actually open and close or to even grip something. This, an application for this might be an auto assembly plant where you're grabbing a, a metal part to be welded into an, another area. Okay, we That's have time maybe for one more and I'll load your disk for you. Okay, this is another uh, sophisticated 3D application where we're actually computing the location of an aircraft in flight. So the first thing that will happen is we'll be looking out the front of the, the um, airplane at a, a, a building or a hangar, and then we're going to taxi up the runway, make a right turn, taxi down the runway, make another right turn, and take off. Okay, and you talked about the speed of about six and a half million. What was the unit's? Floating point computations per second. Um, most computers are measured in MIPS, and some are measured in what's called FLOPS, and the uh, difference being that it's either an integer mathematics or it's a floating point mathematics. Okay, let's see what this is. Okay, the, so what I'm doing now is I'm sitting at the runway, and I'm going to accelerate the plane as it goes toward the building. I'm turning the rudder now using the mouse and locking in on a direction. And then I'm going to sweep, sweep around and get back onto the main runway. And now as I I'll accelerate the plane still further, raise the flaps, just like in a normal takeoff, I can switch between the, uh, the viewing angle of the pilot looking um, out the front of the window to the viewing angle of the 
um, okay. from the tower, and now I'm off the ground. Done is very impressive. Okay, if you watch television, you are familiar with computer graphics. Some of the effects you see on the computer chronicles are, in fact, generated by computer. Well, we'll see a very sophisticated video computer graphic system in just a minute. Joining us now is Ann Chase, who is a freelance computer artist, and Kevin Prince. Kevin is engineering manager at MCI Quantel. Now, Ann, you uh, played around with a picture of me at the break just before we got to the segment. Uh, that was animation, I take it. And mm -hmm. how do you do that with this system? Well, basically, I can find that animation stack in the library and show you how I set it up just by tapping. It's cell by cell is how it's set up. And here you can see that I just drew the tie and rolled it up on your neck. So you captured the real picture and then drew on top of the real picture mm -hmm. and then just did the, the cell animation. Right, just cycled the animation in. Does, this, does this machine do all that uh, with just commands that you give it? The yeah, basically just your artistic ability and you know what you can do using the capabilities of the machine. Kevin, what are the capabilities of the machine? What kind of, what kind of hardware or software is supporting this system? Well, hardware-wise, we're based around the 68,000 processor, as the uh, previous uh, people were talking about. But um, we've got a lot of dedicated hardware to do all the, the fast wipes, the actual painting and drawing in the system, and changing all the brush sizes, etc. It's taken us some time to develop that, but associated with that is probably more importantly is the actual software uh, interaction with the, with the uh, with the user. Mm -hmm. uh, everything you see is, is, a, is obviously a very large um, operating system that we've had to divide for the system. And could you show us? You mentioned drawing and brush uh, strokes. Some of the freehand capability of the system. Basically, what I'll do here is just wipe the canvas, and you can see that I'm in a paint mode. And I'll, this shows me my brush size, and I'll take a white here, and you can see that I can just paint right on the screen. Mm -hmm. I can choose a different color just by tapping and say a larger brush size and paint over the top of that. Then I can go back and choose that mixed color right off the image and store it to use later. Now, uh, this, this is obviously much finer drawing, greater resolution than some of the earlier things we saw at the beginning of the program. But that, that's a function of what, Kevin? That's basically the way we do our store manipulation, the way we actually store the picture. Uh, we have various methods of mapping the image that we're, we're actually trying to, to work with into the store, very different to uh, individual pixel operations which the other machines will be working with. And, and paint box is, in fact, in use right now in television graphics. How is it being used? Uh, well, the, most of the networks have actually got several, several of these systems, and they very often use the mach machine for uh, their news production. And uh, practically every night you will see some form of uh, over-the-shoulder shot that's probably been generated on the paint box. But hopefully it's so good you would never notice. Now, this system gives you the capability of mixing that which is artistically drawn with that which is real life That's photograph right. mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of a thing. How is that done? Well, actually, I can just go to the live source, and you can see that right now we're taking in a live video source of what we're doing. And at any time, I can, I don't even look at myself. Let's just tap something down and see what we have here. There we have me. And okay, I can so go you ahead have just captured right a still frame from mm -hmm. this live coverage of what you're doing right now, mm -hmm. and now you can paint with it. Right, or I could, let's say I'd like to create a stencil. And just very quickly, I can go in here with a stencil medium and just outline something and fill it. And you're fill why are you filling that now? What I'm going to do is a cut and paste technique. This is a stencil medium that's laid over the image. What I'll do is... This is the word, word processing of art. Mm -hmm. Cut and paste. Yeah. If that's it, yes. Um, and then I'll just paste it up. At this point, we're taking a portion of that image, and we've now got, as you can see, two images. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> Twins. I think that's a vast improvement. That's Twins. right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you, you seem to have a lot of fun doing this. Is there uh, an obst Is there resistance to uh, an artist, or shall we say a pure artist, who's used to dealing in brushes and paints, 
uh, getting comfortable with using this technology? Um, maybe at first there's a, it's a little difficult to use the menu, to learn to think and actually read at the same time while you're drawing. But once you've worked with the system for a short period of time, it's just like second nature. Very simple to use, set up in artist terms. The, uh, it's clear how valuable this would be to a television media. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the area of fine art? And uh, is, is uh, computer art catching on there too oh, or growing? Definitely, definitely. It's the wave of the future. That's what's going to be happening in art in a couple of years. In fact, it already is. Should brush, brush manufacturers worry? No, I mean, no, no, no. They're not in trouble yet. <laughs> not yet. Kevin, we have about a minute left. How far can you go with this technology? Will we get to the point where you could have, uh, where we could be replaced by animated people and sync it up with words? I sincerely hope not. Uh, the way I see it at the moment is that we're providing the means by which an artist can extend their capabilities. We can turn a reasonable artist into a good one and an extremely good one into a superb artist. It's, there's, all we're doing is allowing them to create, create their artwork in a much shorter space of time and in the medium in which it's required. Well, that's fascinating. and You don't exist anymore on that picture, Kevin, but we know you're here. We're all out of time. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.